I would like to give you a little advice for how to prepare for the science portion of the ACT. I've given you some advice in an earlier video for preparing for the ACT or other standardized tests in general, and I really don't know that much about the rest of the ACT, but I can give you some insight into the science portion. A lot of the information that I am about to share actually comes from the ACT um, website itself. If you go to act.org and search around for a little while, you can find a document called Preparing for the ACT Test. And you can download it and get the same information that I am sharing in this video. The free download does have a practice test in it. You can get other practice tests by buying material that's also available on the ACT site. Or if you go to um, a bookstore or Amazon, you can also find other ACT preparation guides. None of them will help if you buy them and never open them. You have to practice in order to get better. If you download the free booklet, Test uh, Preparing for the ACT, um, it has a page that gives you some general test taking strategies, things that I've told you about in my earlier video, such as pacing yourself and using logic and um, reviewing your work and erasing completely. It also has some advice for what to do on test day itself and tells you what you need to bring with you. This may vary a little bit depending on whether you're taking the test in, at our school or at a different location. Um, once you get to the test site, you will be told where to sit and they'll probably walk around and check to make sure that you don't have any prohibited devices, which include cell phones. You cannot have cell phones at the webs at the um, test site. You can't even use your fitness watch or iWatch. Um, in fact, you are supposed to take your watch off during the administration. Please do your own work and don't try to change any answers when you're not working on that particular section of the test. You can't give help to anybody else. Keep your eyes on your own paper. You're not allowed to use highlighters, colored pens or colored pencils, notes, dictionaries, or any scratch paper or anything else for that matter. If you have a calculator, you have to put it under your desk uh, until the math portion of the test. As I said earlier, you can't wear a watch during the administration. You can actually put them face up on your work surface, but you have to make sure that they don't have an alarm or a beeping noise that goes off. If you disturb somebody, then that's going to cause a scene. You might actually um, have your test taken away and no score given. The test is confidential and remains so even after the exam. So you actually should not discuss the test questions, even with other people that were in the room. Don't post anything on social media um, about the test. You can say, I did good or it was hard, but you don't say, hey, what did you get for that part of the question that was about such and such? The ACT national rules do not allow eating or drinking in the, the room. You can bring a snack or a drink with you, but you have to have it put in a bag somewhere and then only use it during the break time outside of the testing room. And of course, there might be other procedures that you have to uh, comply with depending on where you are. So um, just follow the rules. You do not want to cause a scene. This is not the time to push your limits. The science section of the test, which is what this video focuses on, measures interpretation, analysis, evaluation, reasoning, and problem-solving skills in the natural sciences. In other words, it's not really a content knowledge test. It's about skills. It's about what you can do when information is presented to you. You actually have to know only a very little about science. There are sometimes some questions that require you to know something like what, what density is or what an atom is, but most of the information will actually be available on the test itself. 
if you get the normal version of the test, which is what you normally get um, on the test day that's given at male high, then the science section will have 40 questions and you'll have 35 minutes to complete it. If you take this test somewhere else on a national test day, you may actually get a longer test that has 47 questions and you get longer to complete at 45 minutes. Some of those questions, maybe in one entire section of that test, will be um, experimental questions that don't actually count toward your score. They're trying them out for use on a future test. Now, as I said earlier, it's not really a content test. It may ask you questions that are related to earth science or astronomy or physics or chemistry, but you don't actually have to know, um, you know, some very specific information like what specific heat is and the formula for that. So it, if it wants specific information, it will supply that information to you. Instead, it's going to ask you questions that ass assess basically how well you can think. This is an aptitude test. It's a skills or ability test. It's not a knowledge and recall test. So the questions require you to try to understand the information that they give you and then to think about that and answer questions that relate to the information. So they're going to ask you some that are relatively easy like read this graph and then some are going to be a little bit more difficult. You'll have to think critically about relationships between two different graphs or two different pieces of information or maybe even more than two. And they'll ask you some questions that require you to generalize from what they've already told you or to draw information um, interpolations about the information they've given you. They didn't just tell you the answer and you've got to figure it out based on what they did tell you. You cannot use a calculator on the science test. It does give you just a couple of tips for the science test. This first one I would uh, disagree with to a small extent depending on which type of question or passage you're working on and I'll explain that just a little bit later. It suggests that you should read the passage carefully. Um, before you begin answering any of the questions, you got to make sure you understand what it's talking about. Now, like I said, I'm not sure that's actually necessary on all the different passages. I'll explain that. But what is important is to look at the tables and the graphs. A lot of times people look at the table and the graph and they get caught by the visual information. But the written text is also important. You've got to read the legend. You've got to read the title of the table or graph or figure so that you can figure out what it is about so that you know when to apply it to a specific question. And some of the more difficult questions in the ACT um, science portion of the test, it is going to ask you to compare information between different hypotheses or different people's viewpoints or interpretations of data. So these conflicting viewpoint questions may be just a little bit harder. And so as you are reading a passage, it may be helpful to make a few notes, to underline or put some asterisks beside key pieces of information that show differences in what the, the uh, potential people, um, well, potential questions are going to be about. So the test will give you several sets of scientific information, uh, passages, so to speak, and each of those is going to be followed up by a given number of multiple choice questions. It used to be that all the um, sections, depending on which type of passage it was, you could tell how many questions were going to be asked. But that's no longer the case. Now it kind of varies, but mostly it's around six or seven questions per passage. The most important part of what you're seeing on the screen now is that it tells you the scientific information is conveyed in one of three different formats. These are the three different types of passages. Data representation, research summaries, and conflicting 
viewpoints. In other words, when you open up the book and get to the science section, you can actually look at, say, passage number one and figure out whether it is a data representation, a research summary, or a conflicting viewpoint passage. And that's going to make a little bit of a difference in the way that you approach the questions and whether or not you have to read closely or not. So when you get to data representation, what that means is basically the way it's named. It's just a graphs and chart question. It's going to focus almost exclusively on what is presented in a graph, a table, or a figure. The research summary, on the other hand, is going to say, here's what a scientist did. And a lot of times it'll say, here's what a, another scientist did. And it's going to ask you whether or not you understand research. Do you understand the way science works? And then a conflicting viewpoint, or what I call the fighting scientist passage, is going to set up several different people's idea of what data means. So instead of focusing on how it was done, this is more about how you interpret it. Those are probably the most difficult passages. The ACT tells you that the data representation passages will be about one third of the test. So if you have six passages, that means two of them are going to be data representation. The reason why I think that's important is because if you can locate those two and go ahead and answer those questions first, I think that's a really good strategy. Now, if this is the first time you've ever taken the ACT, then you may be a little bit reluctant to skip around. But if you wanted to have a really good test strategy, what you should do is try to answer all the easy questions first. And in my opinion, data representation passages have easier questions than the other two types. Here's what a data representation passage might look like. Now, it says passage one. Don't expect it to always be passage one. But basically, there's one paragraph of information followed up by a table and a graph. Since there's very little writing, you can probably be reassured that this is going to be data representation. And that's especially bared out if you look at the first two questions. In question number one, it says, according to figure one. And in question number two, um, if you read it for a while, it says, based on figure one. So if you just kind of let your eyes wander over the first couple of questions, and if it says, hey, look at this table, and it gives you the specific table to look at. If it says, look at this graph, and it gives you the specific graph or figure to look at, that's a data representation passage. And as I said earlier, my recommendation is, is that you do those first. I would go so far as to say that to save yourself some time, I would not read that entire first paragraph. This is where I, I said that I would disagree maybe with some of the advice that the ACT gives. If you identify it as a data representation passage within the first few seconds of looking at that there's only one paragraph of information, a couple of three graphs, and then it says according to figure one. If I were you, I'd read about the first sentence or maybe even first half of a sentence of the paragraph and I would skip the rest. You are not, in most cases, going to be asked information about that paragraph. It's going to focus on the tables and the figures. So you read a study was conducted to examine whether female and it gives us a kind of scientific name. You don't need to know that name. Species of cockroach, prefer to eat cat food, cheese, ham, or peanuts. Got it. It's, it's, a, it's an experiment. I understand. Don't, if I were you, I wouldn't even read the rest. If you understand that this is a data representation passage. If your test has six passages, then three of them are going to be research summary passages. These are a little more difficult than data representation, though not terribly hard, um, just going to require a slightly different strategy. You've really got to understand the difference and the similarities, but especially the differences between the different research scenarios that you will be presented with. So 
here's what a typical research summary passage might look like. You'll notice there is more writing because it has to go into very specific detail about how this experiment was set up and about how it differed in the different experiments. You'll notice there's still charts and graphs. That's going to be a big part of the question, but it'll say something like experiment one and experiment two or trial one, trial two or test one, test two. As soon as you glance at the page and you realize that it's talking about two or three or four different experiments, that's a research summary passage. What it means is you are going to have to try to read a little bit more closely before you ever start answering questions. And especially you need to look at those graphs, read what it says right above the graph, and then look at the key and make sure you understand what that graph or that table or that figure is about. Now, even though I said you have to read it more closely, I still wouldn't read this word for word if it were me. Okay, but I'm an experienced test taker. But if I looked at this and I, I would read the first paragraph and I saw a chemical equation, I wouldn't try to understand that chemical equation. I would just make a note. That's a chemical equation. And then I'd see a little chemical setup. Okay, I understand. That's, that's the setup. And then I read the next paragraph and then I get to this part where it says, in each trial of the experiments, steps one through three were performed. I, would, I wouldn't necessarily read through those at this point so much as just make a mental note that it's given me what was uh, done and what was held constant. It may ask me a question about what was the same between the experiments. That's when I would come back to this part. And so uh, the last part is just basically going to set up how the uh, graphs and data tables and so forth come into play. So here are the two figures that are associated with this particular passage. I'll take a quick look and I think, well, they look very, very similar. Well, as soon as you say that to yourself, that they look similar, try to find a difference. Do you see it? It's on the X axis. And so make a mental note of that, that this has something to do with the volume of gas collected. So that is the responding or dependent variable. When I change the mass, that's figure one, or the temperature, that's figure two. Okay, got it. Now I understand the difference between those two experiments. I can move on to the questions. When you get to the questions, you need to make a very careful note about which experiment is asking about. For example, in question 14 there, it says, consider the volume of gas collected in the trial experiment two. Don't even look at figure one, which had experiment one. You only want to pay attention to figure two. It will have the answer. The second one does ask you to compare experiment one and experiment two. Okay, so that's going to be maybe a little bit more time consuming to do that question, but it's still basically just a read the graph type question. So I should be able to answer that if I just concentrate on um, reading the graph and picking the right column. <laughs> Don't get mixed up and get the two experiments reversed. Just for fun, let's see if you can answer question number 15 here on the screen. As soon as you get a question where you can see in the answers that is comparing two things like the two experiments here, <clears throat> what you need to do is focus on one of those more than the other because that will help you eliminate some of the answers. So when I read the question it says how many temperatures were tested? Now I remember by looking at figure two that the x-axis was temperature. So I look at figure two first, which represents experiment two, and I see five points, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 degrees. That's five. So I look down this column and I say, well, in experiment two, there were five temperatures. There's only two choices. It cannot be A or C because those have ones for experiment number two. So I've already, I've already improved my chances to 50% now, even if I just guessed at this point, I've got a 50% chance of getting it correct, but it's pretty easy to distinguish uh, experiment the column one, which is going to be correct because it does not have five temperatures. So it po can't possibly be D either. That leaves only one choice, folks. It's B. So by using the process of elimination, you can get this question right relatively quickly. Focus on one of the columns and just eliminate choices that can't be right. Mark those answers out and then uh, go to the other column and mark out the wrong answer there.
there's only four choices. So if you can mark out three lines, you've got the correct answer. Pick that answer, move on to the next question. Now the last type of passage that you're likely to have is a conflicting viewpoint question, or what I call the fighting scientist question. This is going to be um, something that you're going to have to read pretty carefully because it's going to explain how um, some kind of observation has been made, some kind of data has been gathered, but people are interpreting it differently. Maybe they don't have enough data or maybe they just are coming at it from two different, completely uh, different viewpoints. But for whatever reason, there's an argument and your job is to, um, it's going to ask you questions like, which one would have said this? You know, which one would, would not say this? Um, if I had some new data, now which one would have a better interpretation? These types of passage questions and this type of passage does require a little more time. So if I were you and I identified this as a conflicting viewpoint passage, I might skip it and come back to it at the end when I, uh, when I realize how much time I have left so that I can figure out exactly how closely I can read and uh, pay attention to the details. Now, I've looked at lots of ACT uh, sample tests and so as soon as I turn the page and I see this, I go, oh, this is a conflicting viewpoint. How did I know? Because I see these little sections that are titled student one, student two, or it'll say scientist one, scientist two. Um, that it, when it focuses on people, it's a conflicting viewpoint question. And especially when you look at the first question and it says based on student one's explanation, is focusing on an interpretation. That's a conflicting viewpoint passage. What that means is I've got to read this pretty carefully. I need to go through student by student in this particular passage and make a note of what differs because there's going to be several different um, properties that are being discussed here, obviously from the table, mass, volume, density, melting point, and boiling point. And some of these people are going to pay more attention to one of those variables than the other. And so I need to make sure I understand which student stands for which of the different variables or samples. So when I see that it's going to be a conflicting viewpoint, like I said, you need to make very careful note about the differences between the different viewpoints because the questions are going to focus on that. So when I start reading like student one and I read the first few words, if two samples have the same values and I kind of glance down, I see that all of them start the same way. If two students, if two samples have the same. So where I'm going to need to make a note is what comes right after those similar, uh, the similar stems. So like for student one, it says the same for all five properties. For student two, it says any three or more. Student three, it says mass, volume, and density. And student four, it says density, melting point, and boiling point. So student three and student four are kind of like student two. It's three properties. But student two, it's any three. Student three and four are very specific on which three. Now, if you go one step further, the ACT will almost always be very organized. And you may not realize this, but it really is a help and a time saver. So if you look at student three, for example, it says, mass volume density look at the table see that's mass volume density it's the first three variables that are listed in the table and then the student four will be density melting point and boiling point do you notice how that's the last three columns so that actually kind of helps you out it, you can go a lot faster student three is going to be mass volume density student four density melting point boiling point they overlap in density and they differ in the first two and the last two so if you just make a note of that, that the, that the ACT is almost always really organized like that. The questions will kind of come in order of, and the table information will correspond. Then that'll help you save a little bit of time. But there's our differences. Student one is going to be anything goes. Student two, three, and four are going to have similarities. It's just going to be which of the variables are going to be constant. So you look at question, the next question, for example, the first question of that passage, it says, based on student one's explanation, don't pay attention to two, three, or four. Only look at one, which says all five properties have to be the same substance. That would mean all five properties are the same. 
And so you just glance through the table and you find pairs of samples that are the same. Not all your pair choices are going to be in the list. So when I look at A and B, I see a difference. When I look at C and D, they're exactly the same. So I'm going to look through my list and I see sample C, sample C and D. That's the answer. I wouldn't, I would not go any further than that. Okay. I looked at the question. I answered the question with C and D. I found the answer C and D in the choices. There's no need for you to make the rest of the pairwise comparisons. It's, it's just a waste of your time. Your job on the test is to find the right answer. And once you've found it, go to the next question. Now the test is organized into, let's say, six passages. And those six passages are one of three types. But within those passages, each passage is going to have, let's say, six or seven questions. It turns out that each of those questions also have a type. The questions are basically uh, divided into three categories themselves that can occur in any passage. So if you have a data representation passage, it's got six questions. Well, some of those questions are interpretation of data. Some might be scientific investigation and some might be evaluation of models, inferences and experimental results. So you can find these three types of questions within any of the three types of passages, but you're more likely to find some in one place than another. So for example, in a data representation passage, most of the questions are probably going to be interpretation of data. And those are the easiest questions and why I think you should do the data representation first. So what does it mean by interpretation of data questions? And this is going to be nearly half of your questions. It means, can you read a chart or a graph? Can you read a, a figure, a table? So um, basically, it's just going to ask you questions about the extensive number of tables and figures that have been included in the test. Now, some are going to be a little harder than others. But in general, I think these are the easiest questions. This is more math than it is science. And in some cases, like I said, they might be a little harder because it's going to ask you to interpolate. That means to read between the, the, the dots on the line or extrapolate. That means go beyond the data that you've been given. So that requires a little bit of skill. But in general, these, these questions are really not that hard and you ought to do them as quickly as possible, but you ought to get these right because this is going to be upwards of half of your points. And if you get all, all of them right, then you are already on your way to making a good score on the ACT science section. Here are a couple of examples of interpretation of data questions that come in a data representation passage. Okay, so basically they're going to refer you to a specific figure or table diagram, however it's labeled. So anytime you see that, it says, look at figure one, look at table one. That is a data um, interpretation of data question and you ought to do it, get it right. Take your time and do it right, but it ought not to take you very much time. If you've actually looked at the tables and the figures and you looked at, at what the uh, axes are labeled, what the variables are, you ought to be able to pick these answers out fairly quickly. Here's a interpretation of data from a different type of passage. This is from the research summary passage. But again, it says how many temperatures were tested in experiment one and how many were in experiment two. Well, that was two different graphs. And all you have to do is look to see what, how many temperatures are on the graph in experiment one and how many are on the graph in experiment two and then find the answer. One more example of an interpretation of data is coming from a conflicting viewpoints or fighting scientists passage. But again, it's saying, suppose the temperature of sample A, okay? Sample A was one particular figure. You can look at that or graph. And it, this is going to be an extrapolation question because it asks you what happens if you increase, you know, maybe beyond the data that you were given.
but still, if you just follow the line, you should be able to figure this one out. And you better get it right. These are the easy points. Now, the second type of question is a scientific investigation question. This is going to be about one fourth of your questions. This is going to be about science itself. Do you understand what a control is? Do you understand what variables are? Um, and do you basically understand um, terms like hypothesis and prediction and so forth? And can you do it? So it's, this is a science process skills question. Here's an example. A student predicted um, that this bug would eat less cat food than ham by the end of the study. Do the data support this prediction? Okay, so it's asking about, do you understand what the, which one of the figures to look at? And do you understand what it's trying to tell you? Can you make a prediction? Okay, just make sure it's got yes, yes, no, no. As soon as you figure out whether the answer is yes or no, mark out the other two so you don't waste time on them and then find out what the difference is between the two answers. If I just glance at A and B, for example, I see that the difference has to do with that 95, 55. So you don't have to pin it right down. If you can't read the graph and, and get exactly 55, but it's close to 50, pick that answer. If it's close to 100, pick the other answer. Don't You don't have to prove to the exact decimal point what the answer is on a multiple choice test. Save yourself some time. If you eliminate the other answers, the remaining answer has to be correct. Here is another example of a scientific investigation question. It says, which of the following variables remain constant? So it's asking you which of the variables did not change between the different experiments. So you have to understand the experimental setup. Uh, here's another one. Suppose that in trial, the trial in experiment one, it's repeated, but now we've got some other setup. So it's asking you about the process of actually doing the experiment. That's a scientific investigation question. That'll be approximately one fourth of the questions. You should be able to get them right, but they may take you a little more time than the uh, interpretation of data questions. One more example, the particular strain of whatever that is. Don't, don't get hung up on the exact words, okay? It's not gonna try to trick you and you don't really need to remember that. So this strain was chosen for its lack of normal DNA repair mechanisms. Now, before you even go any further, why do you think that is? Maybe you can already answer the question without having to go you know, into great detail or look back. If it's got no normal DNA repair mechanisms, they obviously were studying that, this is, this is gonna be their control, okay? So they didn't want that particular bacteria to be able to synthesize any DNA. As soon as you read that answer, you go, well, there's the answer right there, it's A. And then you pick it and you, you go on. Don't waste any more time reading the rest of the answers. If you find the right answer, circle it, move on. You don't have to prove anything. The last type of question that you'll get, and this will be about one quarter to one third of your questions is an evaluation of models, inferences, and experimental results. So let's just call it an evaluation question. Basically, it's going to ask you to compare two things, two different models, two different interpretations, um, two different sets of data, and it's going to ask you to draw a conclusion or to make a prediction. And these are a little bit harder. These are going to take a little more time. These require a little bit more close reading. Here's an example of an evaluation question. Suppose study two had been repeated, but in a lab kept at minus one, the total volume now is gonna be uh, which, which the following. So it's asking you, do you understand what the difference is gonna be if a variable is entirely changed? All right, you don't necessarily have to understand everything that was done. This is a place where it would really help to know something. If it has something to do with water, what's going to happen at minus one? Uh, it's going to freeze. So you should be able to pick an answer. It's got to be A or B near zero because the water is going to be freezing. And it's got to be A because it's below freezing. So I haven't even seen the question. And yet I can, I mean, the, uh, the passage, and yet I can pick the answer. It's going to be A. Sometimes you just got to use logic and a little bit of knowledge. Here are some more examples of evaluation questions. Which of the 
students two, three, and four would be likely to agree that sample A and B are composed of the same substance. So this is where you really had to pay attention to what was the difference between two, three, and four. This is the back on that passage that, I, that uh, two, three, and four all pick three variables, but it was uh, two was any three variables, three was the first three, and four was the last three. And so if you look at sample A and sample B, the first two that are going to be in the line and see what the differences are, that's going to tell you which of the, the two students, I mean, which of the students would be wrong. And so the remaining two students would be right or would, would pick that as the same substance. Number 12, again, when it says likely to agree, that's an evaluation question. These take a little more time, a little more effort. It's going to make you compare two things. So instead of being able to read off of one graph, you're probably going to have to look at two. It's important that you practice. Like you need to get ready for the ACT. There's, there's no substitute for preparation. And if you practice, then you should look for these types of passages and types of questions. Just to summarize what I've said so far about the science portion of the ACT. The passages are divided into three categories. Data representation means the focus is on um, tables, graphs, or diagrams of some sort. In my opinion, these passages are going to be the easiest for you to uh, get the most questions correct. And since your job on the ACT is to get as many questions correct as possible. If you really want to be efficient with your time, you would learn how to find the data representation passages and answer those questions first. That's going to require you to skip around a bit on the answer sheet, but if you're careful, you can do this. So um, find the data representation passages, then look for the research summaries. The research summaries, you're going to have to read a little bit more than in the data representation but they're they're not quite as hard in my opinion as the conflicting viewpoint passage research summaries they'll give you two three four experiments and summarize them and what you need to look for mainly are going to be the differences between them but also note any similarities and then some of the questions will focus on those differences and similarities now some of them are going to focus on charts and graphs Okay, and again, those should be easy. So even within a section, if you can skip around the different questions and pick out the ones that are easiest and do those first, you'll score the most points. The hardest passage, in my opinion, is the conflicting viewpoint passage or passages. Hopefully you'll only get one, but if you get two, find them. And in my opinion, you should put those off to last. They require you to evaluate the opinions of two different people or to compare and contrast two different hypotheses. So it will be a point of view uh, that you have to think about for each question and say which of those agrees or disagrees depending on which way the question asks uh, for, for an answer. Now within each of those three types of passages there's going to be say six or seven questions. Those six or seven questions are themselves divided into three categories. Interpretation of data is going to be about half your questions or almost half your questions. That's going to be more or less straightforward. Read the uh, table, read, read the figure, the diagram, the graph. And again, if, if you're able to skip around, if you're one of those type of people that, that you don't have to do everything, uh, you know, one question after the other, my recommendation is you find the interpretation of data questions within a, a passage and you answer those first. Those are going to be your easiest questions. They're going to take you the least time, but you're most likely to get them correct. Then you should do those first because what you want to try to do is get as many correct as possible. Scientific investigation is going to ask you questions about the processes of science, like what is control, what's the variable, and then the evaluation questions those are going to be a little more difficult. You may want to put those off until last within any given passage. Uh, they don't necessarily come as the last question, so you have to be aware of that. 
but it's going to ask you to compare information between two tables, two figures, two people, two points of view, and, and make some sort of conclusion. Or it's going to ask you to uh, extend into a new data set that's not given. So you have to look at the model that's currently given and say, here's what would happen next. So again, these are the types of questions and the types of passages in the ACT science portion. You will never get a question or a passage that doesn't fit this model. That's one thing about standardized tests is they're very constrained in what they can put on the test and how they can ask questions. Okay, so if you know what the framework is, then you're already a step ahead. What I just said about the framework for how the passages are set up and how the questions themselves are categorized is true for all the sections on the ACT or any standardized test for that matter. So again, I highly recommend that you don't just practice taking questions, but you practice identifying where it fits in the framework because sometimes that will help you find the answer. It'll help you find a way to approach the question in order to get the answer most quickly. So um, the English section, the math section, the reading section, they all have particular types of passages and particular types of questions. If you get the ACT preparation uh, book or you look online, you can find what that framework is. And I highly recommend that you do that for any standardized test, not just for the ACT. If you really wanted to get ready for a test, then you should look for the standards on which that test is based. The ACT has what it's called college and career readiness standards. And the entire test is based on those standards. So the standards are sort of like the, the goal. Here's what students should be able to do. And if you can find that college and career readiness standards and look them over, you will have a much better idea of what is on the test and what isn't on the test. If it's not in those standards, it will not be on the test. That's true for any standardized test. And it's also true for most uh, teachers and professors. If I'm making out a test, I look to see what my standards are. What was I hoping students would be able to know, understand, or be able to do by the time I got done teaching the unit and they got done doing the work? And the questions, if you want to make out a good test, will be all be based on those standards. So let me recommend that you look the ACT College and Career Readiness Standards up and just glance over them at the very least. You may be wondering what kind of score you might be uh, aiming for on the science portion of the ACT. Well, first, let me just back up and say that there used to be a um, score that you were required to make in order to graduate on the English and the reading and the math sections of the test. It's my understanding that that's no longer the case. Making a benchmark score, as it's called, on English reading or math section is a qualifier for graduation, and you have to meet at least one qualifier. So it is probably the easiest way to, to um, meet one of your qualifiers, but there are other options these days. Anyway, the bottom line is, here's what colleges are required to look for in the state of Kentucky. If you look at the ACT score column, if you want to get into a college in Kentucky, then to be admitted, you should have an English ACT score of 18 or higher, a reading score of 20 or higher, and a math score of 19 or higher. Now, if you don't, you can still be admitted, but what will happen is they will put you into a remediation course that you will have to pay for but you will not get credit for. It won't count toward your graduation. So it's going to cost you potentially thousands of dollars. So my recommendation is you spend, uh, you know, the $50 or less to take the ACT again and meet all three of those scores, 18, 20, and 19. Now, the math you might notice is divided into three sections. 
And I believe what that is aiming for now is if you declare a major uh, upon entering, the major may have a math subscore there that is higher than 19. So for example, if you just want to go to University of Louisville, they're looking for a 19 or better. But if you want to get into the speed school of engineering at the University of Louisville, they're going to look for a 27 or higher. So what about science? Science is not a required benchmark, but it is one that a lot of colleges look for. And what you want to make on the science, in my opinion, is about a 24. A 24 on the science section is a predictor that you can pass a college level science class. So uh, it, it predicts basically that you can make a C in a college class. So you want to aim higher than the English reading and the lowest math subscore there. You want to make a 24 or better on the science section, which is one reason why I'm doing this video, because I want you to make a 24 or higher. I'm sure one of the questions you might have is, when do I have to take the ACT? Well, if you are a junior at Mel High School, we are giving it on Tuesday, April 13th just a, um, a little over a week after we start back in-person sessions. Now, what if you are a virtual person? I have no idea what they're going to do at the time that I'm making this video. Stay tuned. Uh, there is a way to take the test online, but you would have to do that at a testing center. You couldn't do that at home, so you might as well come to school and take it. But I really don't know what's going to happen. Um, just stay tuned, but right now they're, they've got us ready. Basically, as teachers, we've had to take some um, uh, professional development training on how to administer the ACT, and it is planned for Tuesday, April the 13th. Now, if you are not a junior and or you um, want to really improve your chances of getting into a good college and into a good program at that college, I recommend that you take uh, some of the later tests, such as the one that is in June or the one that's in July. I know you may not want to spend your summer day testing, but that would be a really good time because you're a lot more in control of your schedule and you can also um, pick and choose maybe where you want to take it. So you need to get on there and register early. So you got a better chance of getting into a testing site that you want to get into. But um, please don't just rely on the single statewide test date to basically control your future. OK, even if you make all 30s, you could do better. I knew a, a student once who took the test. I bet he took it 10 times and he ended up getting lots of, of great scores not all on the same day, but the ACT will combine your scores into what's called a super score. And by the time this fella had finished um, taking this test several times, his super score was so high that he had so much keys money built up and he got a full scholarship to the University of Kentucky that uh, basically it paid for his dorm and it paid for his food plan. And so he got a full ride as well. He didn't have to pay for any of his courses. He ended up graduating four years later from the University of Kentucky and then going on into medical school. And I saw him recently and he's a doctor now. So taking the test several times can be very beneficial. I hope that uh, this little set of advice helps you a little bit to make a better score. I know you can do it. It takes practice. It takes a plan. It, it, you have to do some of those things that I, I told you about in the earlier video, such as making sure that you've had plenty of sleep, that you've had a good breakfast, that you're not stressed out. If you don't make a good score the first time, make a better plan and do better the next time. Don't go with just one score on this test. It's too important. Okay. If you think I can help you in any other way, then please let me know. But I know that you can make a high score on the ACT.